Hi. In this video, we are going to explore the mechanisms for water transport in a plant from soil to roots through all of the tissues of the plant until the point where it eventually uh, evaporates from the surfaces of leaves through the process of transpiration. And uh, we probably should begin this exploration by looking at what happens at the roots. When you explore the roots of plants, you're going to discover that there are going to be these uh, modified epidermal cells that are going to be known as root hairs. Root hairs are going to have uh, an extended surface area that will allow them to take up more water and minerals needed by the plant. It is going to be precisely because of this extended surface area uh, that it is considered that most of the surface of the root is going to be made up uh, by the surfaces of these root hairs. Now, let's take a look at the possible pathways water and minerals can follow. This is a little bit of reviewing. The apoplastic route is going to consist of uh, the water and minerals that are going to be moving through the cell walls of the plant cells that are forming the root hairs. But eventually, as we move from the epidermis of the root, we are going to reach cells of the cortex. And here, those cell walls will still allow for this apoplastic pathway for water and minerals to continue their way as they are approaching this region here, which is known as the vascular cylinder or stellar. In addition to the apoplastic route, we have also identified in class a symplastic route. Remember, symplastic means within. Within the cell, within the cell cytoplasm, water will become part of the solution of cells. Minerals will also do the same thing. And this water and minerals in solution are going to easily move from one cell to another through these gaps between plant cells known as plasmodesmata. And they will continue also the way uh, as they approach the vascular cylinder of the root. Uh, one of the things that we know with regards to water and minerals, as we compare the concentrations outside of the root compared to the vascular cylinder, is that this vascular cylinder is going to have a greater concentration of water, but also a greater concentration of minerals. And a lot of it has to do with the function performed by this layer of cells. Notice that this layer of cells known as the endodermis is going to be a single uh, cell type of a layer. By single cell, I mean it's just going to be one cell in terms of thickness. So let's take a look at what happens to these materials like water and minerals as they approach through the apoplast or the symplast uh, here before they enter the vascular cylinder. And what we are going to see is that the endodermis is going to be responsible for producing a waxy material. You can see that in this slide represented as purple lines. This suberin or waxy material is going to be waterproof. As you can deduct, what would happen now is that water moving through the apoplast will not be able to make it into the vascular cylinder, but it wants to go over here. So the only way water and minerals moving through the apoplast will be able to continue their pathway into the vascular cylinder is if they cross the plasma membrane of the endodermis. And what we know about this plasma membrane of these endodermis cells is that it is highly selectively permeable, more so than some of the other cells that were part of the cortex or the epidermis. And so what would happen now is that there are certain minerals that are not going to be allowed into the vascular cylinder because they can be harmful to the plant. Uh, the endodermis is also going to be important because in addition to regulating what comes in, the endodermis is also going to prevent water backflow or also the flow of minerals back into the cells of the cortex or into the apoplast and eventually back into the soil. Remember that just a moment ago I said to you that the concentration of minerals is going to be greater in the vascular cylinder compared to the concentration of minerals in the soil solution. 
And uh, the key reason for that is going to be this highly selective, uh, selectively permeable nature of the endodermis and the Casparian strip that these cells are going to be secreting. So what's going to happen now that water and minerals have entered the vascular cylinder? Let's see. Water will now will be transported from the bottom of the plant where the roots are up to the trunk and the stems and the leaves up in the higher canopy of the plant. When water and minerals collect in the vascular cylinder, at that moment we have what we can call xylem sap. And uh, it's going to be pulled up to the top rather than pushed is going to be pulled because of the process of transpiration. Let's see what happens up close to the water that reaches the leaves of a plant. And so if we focus on this illustration, we will see that water uh, is part of the xylem sap and it's going to be delivered to the leaf. This is going to be one of those leaf veins uh, pointing out in this presentation. These are going to be the bundle she uh, sheath cells and uh, I did something I didn't intend to do, but here we go again. And so water will be moving from the cell walls of these bundle sheath cells over to the cells that are forming the spongy mesophyll. Let's focus on one of these spongy mesophyll cells. You will see that the cell wall, which is illustrated right here, the cell wall of the spongy mesophyll cell is going to consist of several microfibrils of cellulose. But notice that this is not like a continuous bundle of microfibrils. There's going to be spaces in between these microfibrils where water is going to be moving. As water moves in between those spaces, it will eventually reach what we call the air-water interface. This air here is going to be the air in the air spaces formed by the irregular shapes of the spongy mesophyll. This air has entered the leaf through the opening we call the stoma. The stoma, remember, is regulated by these guard cells. So what happens now is that the water potential of this air is going to be so low, much more lower than the water potential you find here in the cell walls of the spongy mesophyll cells. And consequently, water will begin to uh, evaporate will begin to turn into vapor going from a higher water potential in the cell walls of mesophyll cells to the lower water potential in the air existing inside of the leaf of a plant. Now look at something uh, interesting that happens here. As water evaporates, this layer here is going to uh, cave in momentarily. This is going to be for a moment developing like a negative pressure and, and this is going to end up pulling more water to once again smooth out this air water interface that exists inside of the leaves of plants. What happens to these water molecules that have evaporated now is that they're going to go out through the stoma and that movement of water through the stoma out of the leaf is called transpiration. And so the question we ask is, xylem sap, is that going to be pushed or pulled? And by now, you should have a pretty good idea that xylem sap is going to be pulled up uh, to the plant because leaves are going to be having this water transpiration as water escapes out of the leaf, that water has helped pull more water up through the various tissues of the plant, for sure through the xylem uh, vessels and tracheids. One of the things that also happens with plants is that at nighttime there's going to be an active transport of uh, minerals and ions into this the vascular cylinder and with those there will be also water moving into the vascular cylinder and that is going to create a little bit of a positive pressure so roots can be pressurized at nighttime but one of the things that I want to emphasize is that that water pressure that may be present at nighttime is not a significant factor in the movement of water up to the leaves. And I want to make this clear, and uh, I hope that you can uh, understand this. Overall, the movement of water through the xylem is going to be because of ne negative pressure. 
meaning water is getting pulled rather than pushed. Uh, regardless, so this little bit of a positive pressure that happens in uh, plants may be responsible for a phenomenon you can see even on a dry night with low moisture. You will notice that some plants like this strawberry leaf you see right here, they're going to be at the edges of the leaves, uh, these little droplets of uh, water, and that is going to be a phenomenon known as gotation. And you know that this is not due because you don't find these droplets throughout the leaf uniformly. You only see it at specific places where uh, little pores allow for plants to uh, release some of that water. And remember that's because of that positive pressure. So we have now what we call this cohesion tension hypothesis that says transpiration and water cohesion will be pulling water from the uh, roots, actually I should say from roots to shoots. I have this here a little bit backwards. Water will be pulled from the roots over to the shoots. Please make that note as you are revising your notes as well. So let's explore this transpirational pool and connect concepts we've also studied in this unit. You've learned by now that water will be moving by osmosis from regions of greater water potential to regions of lower water potential. That lower water potential is usually going to exist in places where there's a high concentration of solutes. Solutes attract water, and for that reason, the water potential is going to be lower in those places. So let's take a look at what happens with regards to this water potential gradient. What we need for this system to function, and we're gonna begin from the bottom of the plant, is that the water potential at the roots in the soil is going to, needs to be greater than the water potential inside of the roots. And so if you look at this illustration, that is going to be confirmed. As we continue going up to the bottom part of the trunk of the plant, look at these numbers over here. The soil water potential is negative 0.3, but the water potential here at the base of the trunk is going to be negative 0.6. And remember, we're dealing with negative numbers. So the further away you're getting from zero, as these negative numbers are increasing, is going to be a smaller value. In this case, we're talking about pressure. So a negative 0.6 is a smaller value than negative 0.3 confirming what we're saying. Water is moving from a region of greater water potential to a lower water potential, from a negative 0.3 to a negative 0.6. And watch what happens according to this illustration. This water potential gradient, remember we're going from greater water potential down at the bottom of the plant to lower water potential up at the top. As we go to the leaves, we find that the water potential is a negative one. So this is much uh, lower than what we found down in the soil. And if you go to other parts of the leaf, like the air spaces, you're going to find that the water potential of the air spaces is a negative seven. We're getting further away from zero. These values are actually getting smaller. Water potential continues to decrease. And when you go to the outside air, the outside air can be as low as negative 100 megapascals. And so that is exactly what the plant wants to see uh, to be able to pull water using this negative pressure as a consequence of the, um, the water potential. Now, remember that the force that is pulling the water is going to be a pressure. This is uh, going to be a pressure type of system. And another convenient property of water that allows for this to happen is that water is going to have. Uh, a polar nature because of the polar nature of water. Okay. Because of the polar nature of water, water has two properties. One is going to be cohesion and the other one is going to be adhesion. Let's review those briefly. Cohesion refers to the tendency of water molecules to attract to one another. This hydrogen bond you see forming between two water molecules that's cohesion. And so as water molecules are escaping up at the top of the plant through those air spaces in the leaves, those water molecules that are escaping out 
they are at the time, at the same time, pulling other water molecules that are still within the cell walls of the plant or within the xylem eventually. In addition to cohesion, water also has adhesion, the ability to attach to other uh, materials and other compounds beyond water, besides water. And in this case, water has an affinity for clinging onto the cellulose of the cell walls of plants. And so as water clings onto the cell walls, that is great for the plant because that helps also prevent water from moving back down. Water sticking to the cell walls acts against the force of gravity. And so in conclusion, let's say a few things about the bulk flow of water and minerals uh, by through the um, xylem. And uh, because this is going to be something that is considered bulk flow, how is that different from diffusion and for osmosis? And so a few points to consider here. Number one, bulk flow is going to be driven by differences in pressure potential, not solute potential. And so the water potential we're looking at, water going from greater water potential to lower water potential, that is largely the result of the pressure potential that exists inside of the cells of the xylem. Another difference between bulk flow and uh, diffusion is going to be that bulk flow happens inside of hollow uh, cells that don't have their own cytoplasm anymore. Remember that these uh, vessel elements of the xylem are going to be cells that are dead at maturity. Therefore, water and minerals are going to be moving into these uh, spaces where there's no interference for the movement by other components of what a live cell would have in terms of cytoplasm and organelles. We don't have that here. Another difference between bulk flow and diffusion is that the entire solution is moving here through this vessel element of the xylem. It's not just water, but also minerals that are going to be moving up from roots to leaves. And uh, the main difference that it matters for the sake of water transfer from roots to leaves is that it happens much faster. Many times the distance between the leaves of a plant and the root is going to be hundreds of meters uh, in the case of the giant sequoia trees that we have in California, or sometimes just a couple of meters. We know that the force of gravity will prevent plants from moving water up that high, but bulk flow and the properties of water, such as cohesion and adhesion and the negative pressure, uh, creating this uh, cohesion tension hypothesis is what allows water to uh, reach the leaves. I will, maybe, I will be making another video for uh, helping you understand the concepts of um, flow and sap and how flow and saps also can move through bulk flow.